Science says bulking doesn't work. <laughs> All right, dramatic introduction, check. So we're gonna uh, break this study down. We're gonna dissect it like a frog in science class. And by the end of the video, I will tell you if it is still worth bulking in the year 2023. And uh, I've been bulking, so of course I took this study personally. Anyway, so basically what this study was trying to do, they had three groups, one group at maintenance, a 0% surplus, one group at 5%, so a very, very small surplus, and another group at 15%, so a significantly more aggressive surplus. And they wanted to see, do does this matter for strength? Does this matter for gaining those gains? Does this matter for increasing skin fold thickness? This is a proxy for adding body fat. And when you're totally shredded, which I am absolutely not right now, there's not much skin that you can pinch because there's just very little fat under that skin. Whereas when you are uh, beefed up a little bit, there is a lot more skin that you can pinch and therefore it shows that you are fatter. So they measured squat and bench press one rep max, as well as quad and biceps thickness, as well as that aforementioned skin fold thickness. So it was a little bit of a smaller study, only 17 total participants. They had some issues with COVID and getting people into the lab and, and getting people keeping going on the program or something, which makes sense. Participants had to have a minimum bench press of their body weight, as well as 1.5 times their body weight for the squat. And I think those are pretty reasonable standards. No, those are not like super elite numbers, but if someone is a super elite lifter, they might not want to participate in a study. And I think sometimes people, myself included in the past, are maybe a little bit too hard on studies. It, you have to balance trying to find people and get them to participate and, and take part in the study. Uh, versus having them be at a minimum level that will actually transfer over to other serious lifters. So in terms of results, let's just start with the weird things to keep it interesting. You have the maintenance group, the moderate surplus, and the high surplus. In terms of bench press one rep max, I would have bet, not my life, but I would have bet at like a decent amount of money that the high group would gain the most on their bench. They did not. The moderate group absolutely crushed it. The guy who gained the least in the moderate group gained more than anyone else in any other group. So they were head and shoulders above everyone else. You can see in the chart here, the, the plot, I'll put it up on the screen. Man, moderate group, you guys were crushing it. Team moderate. I mean, I would have sworn that the bigger the surplus, the bigger the bench gains, just because it's sort of common knowledge, not a fact, but it's well understood that if you want to get a bigger bench, you just gain weight, even if that weight is fat, because on a barbell bench press, fat around the chest, around the shoulders, around the elbows, on the upper back, even around the gut, everywhere, just helps you generally, apparently not according to this, to move more weight. You're more stable, you're more solid, everything is more locked in, the bar path is maybe smoother. Um, but yeah, this, this was very surprising. And for the squat one rep max, there don't appear to be any differences. Maintenance, moderate, high, all seem to gain roughly the same amount of one rep max strength. Now, in terms of skin folds, maintenance gained roughly what you would have expected, zero, because they're just maintaining. But moderate and high gained about the same. Those look to be pretty much identical. If anything, the high group seemed to gain less skin fold. So it looks like they gained less in terms of their body fat percentage, which I think means, and this is what they said in the conclusions or the abstract of the study, the high group and the moderate group actually gained roughly the same amount of body weight. So the high group, even with a nutritionist checking things, even with trying to adjust their calories over time to keep on track with the correct amount of weight gain, gained roughly the same amount as the moderate group. And so this just shows that, well, bulking doesn't work. And that's kind of tongue in cheek, but not 100%. You know, you say, okay, I want a 300 calorie surplus and you try to get that amount, but now your activity levels are going up. Your metabolism has increased slightly. Your appetite is going lower. And so your body is pushing you towards homeostasis and you have to be very, very diligent with that surplus, and you probably will have to increase it over time, especially if you seem to have a very adaptive metabolism or appetite. Same thing, but opposite, when you are dieting, 
your body is trying to achieve homeostasis and so it'll make you hungrier, it'll make you lazier, and you'll just sort of end up closer to the same spot than you would think based on math. Now, I don't hate the training plan. It's three days per week, mostly compound movements, back squat, bench press, obviously those are being tested, and then lat pull downs, dumbbell rows, dumbbell shoulder presses, barbell curls, dumbbell hammer curls, dumbbell lateral raises, just, you know, good old bread and butter movements, nothing weird, each movement for three sets each, reps and reserve kept on back squats and bench press, which I think if you're going for strength does make sense. Overall, not a huge amount of volume, only the biceps showed a meaningful amount of changes, and those actually were best in the high group. And so one thing that you might want to keep in mind is that if you are doing more volume, if you're training four days per week, five, six days per week, if you're really doing more movements, if you're training them closer to failure, maybe a bulk would make more sense because you can actually utilize and use that energy. And this brings me to a very important point, something that natural hypertrophy has said a number of times that I 100% agree with. The bulk supports the training. That has to be the case. If that is not the case, you probably should not be bulking. A lot of people can make a lot of progress at maintenance. And I would say in most cases, if you're not making progress, the answer is probably not a bulk. We don't really have an issue in most Western countries, heck, most countries in general now, with skinniness. We, we kind of have an obesity issue, if, if anything. So consuming enough energy is rarely the limiting factor for muscle growth. Occasionally, yes, I'll get to that in a second, but most of the time, it's going to be your training. Speaking of training, big shout out to Boost Camp for sponsoring this video. They are an app where you can track all your progress. You have access to some of the best training programs on the internet. I myself have two programs up there, Rampage and Ravage. You can check them out. They are both hypertrophy focused plans. They are a pretty good amount of volume. And so you're going to have to work hard. It's going to be tough. It's going to be challenging. But if you stick with it, you will absolutely reap the rewards and you will get those gains. Progress has been amazing. There are tons and tons of reviews and comments there, and uh, I'm really happy you guys are crushing it. And so anyone on the plan, keep crushing it. And if you're not on the plan, check it out. I will leave a link in the description. And so my recommendations, they haven't really changed. If you are very lean, if you're shredded, if you're under 10% body fat, I think a bulk makes a lot of sense. The idea that you're going to maintain or main gain or recomp under 10% body fat I think for the vast majority of natural lifters is a pipe dream. And even if you're not natural, I think that is still not the way to go about it. In that case, you're just, you're taking all these steroids, so you're anabolic, but you're not anabolic because you're just not eating enough. So it doesn't make sense in any situation. Um, you look at someone like Tristan Lee, very, very, very lean, and he bulked. And uh, I think from what I remember, he was pretty happy with the results. So under 10%, bulk, go eat some food, get in the calories. You can probably be more aggressive than the vast majority of people. 10 to 15%, I think you should still bulk for most people. I mean, gaining at that level of body fat doesn't really make sense. And I mean a true 10 to 15% body fat. For a lot of people, you know, they think they're 12%, they're actually 18%, you know, because a lot of fitness influencers or muscle magazines or men's health or, athlete x they just don't know how to actually assess a body fat percentage and so they think they are leaner than they actually are but if you're actually 10 to 50 percent which is like full abs in most cases you should still bulk in my recommendation but it should be more moderate a little bit more slowly a little bit more gradually now 15 to 20 percent this is a bit of a gray zone in my opinion you could maybe bulk, especially if you're on the lower side of that. I think some people can benefit from that. I certainly do. If you are towards the higher side of that, you might want to just sort of chill and recomp, main gain. I'm not against main gaining if it's at a reasonable body fat percentage. The issue is some content creators promote very, very, very lean, shredded physiques. People get body dysmorphia. 
they've finished every bulk two weeks into it because you know things blur very very slightly they get a little bit of water retention but i think if you're genuinely 15 to 20 percent main gaining especially towards the top of that is very very viable so you could cut in this situation possibly you could main gain maintain recomp maybe even a lean bulk you know lots of ways to go in that 15 to 20 percent range it's also going to be fairly individual and then 20 to 25 percent Probably a cut in a lot of cases, maybe a maintenance, recomp, main gain kind of thing, depending on your goals, on your set points, settling points, etc. And then if you're above 25% body fat, I think you need to cut. Uh, unless you're in a very unusual situation, like you're a football lineman and you just genuinely don't give a fuck how fat you get. Uh, you know, it's your job, it's your career to be just a... a a beefy boy, then, um, you know, I think that's fair enough. You know, if, if you have a dream of being a professional sumo wrestler, I'm not going to be like, well, your, your hemoglobin A1C is uh, it's a little bit elevated. No, like, get, get thick, bro. Get thick. Uh, sir, your LDL is slightly elevated. Yeah, but my goal is to kill a man when I sit on him. So, you know, mm, kind of got to balance those out a little bit. Can you imagine if someone went up to Julius Maddox or, or Hafter Bjornsson and was like, by the way, this is not the healthiest thing you can do. They know. They they know that being at that weight and other things they're doing is not like prime time for their blood work or whatever. Um, but they are in a very rare and unique position where they can push the limits of what is humanly possible. And so in that case, I don't think they have to follow the normal expected rules. But these recommendations, I think for most people, are uh, going to be pretty solid. Now, I really would have liked to see some kind of body fat percentage data for the participants. I didn't see anything in the study. And if they were, you know, 8% body fat, I would have been shocked by these results. Because I think in that case, a surplus is just very, very, it's basically essential for almost everyone. Um, but if they were already, you know, getting thick and nasty, they were already, you know, a little bit bulked up, maybe like average 20% for the men or 18% or something. You know, to me, that makes perfect sense that they wouldn't see better gains when bulking because they're kind of already a little bit bulked up. If you are already thick and nasty, a bulk is not really going to help much. And so training drives these adaptations, not a surplus when you are already thick and nasty. Now, I thought about reaching out to Dr. Eric Helms to try to get a sense of the level of thickness of the participants when they first started the study. But I know he has a lot on his plate. He is a new professional bodybuilder. He just won his pro card a few weeks ago. So massive congratulations to him. I have been following his journey about as long as I have been lifting weights. So it's awesome to see. It's been, you know, a couple decades in the making. So, uh, you know, congratulations to him and, and, you know, show him some love. Go over to his page. You know, it, that's a big deal. And then he recently competed in the World Natural Bodybuilding Federation World Championships. And so uh, I didn't want to be like, hey, what, how fat were these people, you know, um, just because he, he, he's been busy. Also, big shout outs to Mike Matthews of Legion Athletics and Renaissance Periodization. Mike was one of the first people that I followed in the industry when I first started lifting. And I was very lucky to have such a good source of information when I was just getting started. And then uh, Renaissance Periodization, everyone knows them. They also put out great stuff as well. So uh, I think it's great that they are sponsoring studies and uh, trying to push forward the biggest question of all, how big should your bulking surplus be? I also want to highlight the more ideal your situation when it comes to your training, when it comes to your sleep, when it comes to your stress management, the more aggressively you can likely gain and have a higher percentage of that be muscle. So if you're nailing the training, if you are getting a good amount of sleep every day, you're in a low stress environment, maybe you are on summer vacation or something like that, you're just, you know, you're on vacation, you're still lifting for some reason or something, very, very low stress, you can probably be a little bit more aggressive with the surplus. Whereas if you're in a super high stress environment, your sleep is really, really broken, and you're just not on point with the training, you don't really know what you're doing, you're probably going to gain almost exclusively fat. And so the better your situation, the more aggressively you can bulk and actually take advantage of that. And so if you're looking to get your training in order, you can check out my books. They have been very, very well received. There's going to be a Black Friday sale on from now until 
I don't know, probably Sunday. Maybe Monday is Monday is a thing, isn't it? I'm not good at the salesman thing. Cyber Monday? Cyber Monday. Oh yeah. There we go. Alright, I'll be through Monday. So I won't talk about too much because I don't want to be too salesman-y, but those will be very, very useful in your fitness journey. And it helps me keep doing what I'm doing, putting out videos, making content, etc. I'm a one-man crew. And so uh, this is my full-time job, and I really appreciate the support. It It's not like some corporate thing where it's like, yeah, you help support the corporation. No, this is this is all just what I do, only me. And so I really do appreciate the support. Um, it goes a long way and allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. So thank you so much for everyone who's gotten the books or plans to get the books. Uh, just thank you. I'm going to go eat something because I, you know, got to keep bulking. And I will see all you fine people in the next video. Peace.